Deep in the heart of the Berkshire countryside at Genetic Studios near Reading, London band then Jericho and their producer Martin Rushant are listening to the final mix of Fault, a song for the band's debut album. Rushant is well known for his use of computer-aided music production with bands like Human League and Visage. Just uh, a few years ago, the job of record producer was really coaxing the best performance out of an artist that was possible. Uh, now we use computers to uh, aid that process in, uh, in quite a serious way. I think one of the changes, uh, not so much in my job, but in the way I interrelate with the people I'm working with, is that composition and ideas are now much more important than, than the ability to, to play technically. The production process begins for Russian when he listens to the band's demo tape. He must first decide where and if computers can help. Yeah, all right. What's the tempo on it now? 110. That's OK. Tempo's fine. But it's got to be... If we're going to make a dance rock track, then we've got to hold the tempo all the way through. So I think we'll use some machine assist on it, on the drums, possibly on bass too. Um, I think the intro's a bit long, isn't it? Don't you think? You can cut the intro in half, yeah. You can cut it in half. Well, both sections of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the intro and the so uh, the, the flow funky of bit. the intro will be the same, except each whole, section and will will be shorter. And okay. then go go straight into the verse. All right. Well, look. What we're going to do now? We've got the tempo one 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 zero. Yeah. Okay. We'll get the part written out and program up a Lin guide yeah. pattern for you, and then we'll take bars. it from there. Yeah. So it gives us four bars. Right. Then Jericho's drummer, Stephen Wren, works with Russian's assistant to program a basic drum pattern into the Lindrum. This won't end up on the finished track. It's a guide to ensure that all the other electronic instruments keep time. The Lindrum is not, strictly speaking, a synthesizer. The sounds are digital recordings of real drums, encoded on a memory chip. Well, the Lindrum we now... The Lindrum was really... A few years ago, it was a real breakthrough in, in drum machine technology. Before then, you'd, you'd had these purely sort of things that didn't really sound like drums at all. Uh, so Lynn really did, did sound vaguely like a drummer. And we use it to lay down the basic patterns and ideas of the drummer on tape to use as a sort of uh, um, check against what we're doing to make sure that our higher level machines are playing the basic patterns correctly. I think this film may be totally missing the point. The very first electric instrument was the telharmonium, demonstrated in 1906 in America by its inventor Thomas Carhill. Carhill discovered that by spinning a notched metal disc in a magnetic field, he could create an electrical impulse that would make a musical sound when played through a telephone earpiece. By adding together the output of several different discs, it was possible to create quite complex sounds. The 200-tonne machine was used for a time to broadcast concerts over the Bell telephone system in New York. These ceased when an irate stockbroker, fed up with the interference on his line, purchased the instrument and threw it in the river. But the father of the modern synthesizer is undoubtedly Dr Bob Moog. The Moog modular synthesizer first became widely heard in 1968 on a record called Switched On Bark by Walter, now Wendy, Carlos. It was big brother to the best known synthesizer of all time, the Mini Moog. This is the last uh, author production line, it was made in 1980, the last of about 12,000 that were made between 1970 and 1980. It's an analog monophonic synthesizer. That means uh, it makes the waveforms by electronic means and it plays one note at a time. In an analog synthesizer like this, we start out 
uh, with an oscillator. An oscillator produces a steady pitch sound. And in this synthesizer, we can control the oscillator sound from either the keyboard, from the pitch wheel, or automatically through modulation. The oscillator has a waveform, and that determines the harmonics. Here's a triangular wave. Sawtooth, square, and two rectangular waveforms. With all those harmonics, we can shape the sound through filtering. That is, we can cut out these harmonics as the sound goes on. Here's a filter which cuts out the harmonics starting with the highest. Another important aspect of the sound is its envelope, how it builds up and decays as it goes on. In an analog synthesizer like this, uh, there are four parts to the envelope. The attack, which is the rise, the decay, which is the fall from the highest point, the sustain, which is how loud it is as it, as it continues, and then the release, which is how rapidly it dies to zero when you let go of the key. Here now I have a slow attack and slow decay and fairly low sustain, so you can hear each individual part. First the attack, then the decay, and the sustain, and finally, I let go of the key, the release. OK, Steve, looks like that's the programme. Let's see how it plays. The various machines at Genetic Studios can send each other electronic signals to keep in time. Useful here, because Russian's master plan for the track involves recording most of the drum kit onto tape in the ordinary way, but generating the snare and bass drum sound from the Synclavia, a sophisticated computer and digital synthesizer. So while the cymbals and tom-toms are unalterably committed to tape, Steve and Neil can tinker with the snare and bass drum sound until they're both completely satisfied. Now it sounds, that sounds much too loud. A bit loud, isn't it? It is too loud. All right, let's stop this thing. I ever played a Prophet synthesizer, I knew immediately I wanted one. It was the first synthesizer to use a, a microprocessor inside the synthesizer itself to control not only the sounds and the development of the sounds, making them very precise, but also to read the keyboard so that when you play a note, you're not just closing an electrical switch, but this little brain on a chip is actually walking through each key in turn to see if you're doing anything with it. And you get a very alive sense of uh, feedback from the machine. It uses analog oscillators, such as we've heard and love, which perhaps makes it not as uh, bright sounding as some of the more recent instruments. And uh, one of the sad things, of course, about analog oscillators is that they go out of tune very easily. So if you're playing in a concert and suddenly your synthesizer goes out of tune, you can press this tune button and the whole thing goes away and you can wander off stage and have a rub down. And by the time you get back, the thing will have tuned itself and it should be perfect. This is ridiculous. This film is still missing the point.
I think that a lot of work has disappeared for musicians in the last four or five years, especially in London, where sort of a lot of, I mean, with the agreement in some instances of the Musicians' Union, and in some instances despite the union, uh, musicians in orchestra pits, musicians in studio sessions and so on, have actually found work slipping away from them because it is easier or cheaper to use either a, a pre-programmable synthesizer, a drum machine, whatever it might be, to create fairly regular sounds. In many areas of live work with groups, they don't represent any real threat at all. But it's in the mainly the area of media work and recording that their use has, has become of great worry to us in certain areas where many more musicians were implied than are being used at the moment. And the union's policy is to endeavour to control their uses in areas where we're able to do so. But the problem isn't confined to recordings. In 1982, Barry Manilow toured Britain. On previous tours, he'd used a full orchestra of British musicians. This time, he replaced them with a rhythm section and just three American synthesizer players. Now, this is something, obviously, the union uh, can't accept and will do all it can to try to prevent that situation because it's clearly the synthesizers are being used in that instance uh, instead and as a substitution for string players because that is really the sound that's wanted. The musicians who are going to suffer most are those who have developed skills such as trombone players, trumpet players, uh, violin players, but who haven't got either composing as one of their elements, one of their strings to their bow, if you'll excuse the pun, or they haven't actually got any greatness of performance. They are skilled professionals, but they unfortunately now are in life of being replaced, rather like some technologies in heavy industry are replacing some workers. Um, I think that, in fact, it will turn around inside a decade and many of the musicians who are coming along now will be totally skilled at using uh, computers to create music and therefore they will find employment in that role. I don't think it will mean a long-term erosion of the musician status because I see future society as asking more and more of musicians, demanding more and more musical input for society in the, in, in the information age. Therefore I think musicians and all artists will have a far greater role to play in the future. So I don't think it's a bleak outlook but there are going to be short-term problems. Well, I think the pulsing bits we'll program, yeah? We'll sample a sound off you. Yeah. And we'll program them in. Yeah, you need a much constant, more constant level out of it if you do yeah, it. Yeah, right. And that'll also, we'll be able to lock something up with it. That acoustic we were talking about when we were working the track out, we can lock up with that. At the end part, yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Okay. But I think um, the intros and some of the accents, you sh we'll play those live yeah. and mix them in with, with the machine pulse. OK, Jasper, what we're going to do is we're going to sample this high G into the Synclavier, right? OK. OK, now, I'll do accounting, because otherwise no-one knows when we're going to start, and Neil's got to hit his button before you play right. to set the computer story. Right. So if I count four in, if you hit it on the four and you hit it on the one, we just okay. want one note, let it last as long as you can, yeah. and as clean as you can, all right? Okay. You ready, Neil? I'm ready. OK, one, two, three, four. That's good. OK, that looks good. So let's hear the high G back first before we sample the next one, okay. whilst we're set up on it. That sounds all right. Good. Jasper, play us it again, just so we can get a comparison. So that's the real one. OK, let's hear your one again. If you mark start that one. One of the uh, interesting side effects of um, digital synthesizers is, is, as we mentioned before, their ability to sample sounds. Not just sounds like elephants trumpeting in telephones, but actually off other people's records. Um, drum sounds, bass sounds, brass sounds, in fact it goes on all the time. I've had cases of I've heard a record um, and I thought I'll steal, steal the snare drum sound off that, it's really nice, and got it in the machine and looked at the waveform and found out it was one of mine that's been pinched from somewhere else. So it's going on all the time and uh, I do it quite a lot. Uh, what the publishers and people like that are going to say when they find out actually what's going on is going to be rather interesting. But um, to give you an example of some of the things that are done, um, I've got an album here by an unknown who I think has got a real future, a man named Mr David Bowie. And uh, about a couple of years ago he put out an album with a track on it called Let's Dance. And the bass drum and snare drum sound on that record was rather good. 
and has been pinched by many people, including me. So let me just play you, if I can get that thing down. A bit of Let's Dance. So, this is Let's Dance by David Bowie, which I think is familiar to some people anyway. So we rather craftily sampled the bass drum and snare drum sound off that record. In fact, I've got it loaded in the machine at the moment. Sometimes this machine decides that we're doing something that really is morally wrong and refuses to do it. However, we're trying to teach it that we live in the real world and not in some sort of utopia. So, Neil! <laughs> Neil is going to reboot this machine so that I can but show you. It doesn't like me still. So, as I was saying before the machine decided to disobey, uh, I've loaded in the sounds from this Bowie track in here, the bass and snare drum. It's quite remarkably similar. So, we used that on uh, an album by a young man called Billy McKenzie, who trades under the name of The Associates, on a track called uh, 13 Feelings, which, if I can just uh, find it, and it's not necessarily so that we use the sound exactly the same as we sampled it. We may tailor it to suit our own particular track. Which band is it? Two. Okay. Well, I think it's. Really nice. Right. That's the same drum sound from the record we heard before. It doesn't sound exactly the same because we've tailored it to suit our own track, but it was the character that we were after. And no doubt some crafty devil has sampled that sound and used it on his record. Right, what that is, that's a voice called I Can See. It's actually a voice that's been sampled. Somebody actually said that into a microphone, and it was stored inside the, the uh, Fairlight by digitising it into its memory. It actually fills up 128K of RAM. Uh, that 128K of RAM is in here. This is the CPU unit, which also has, houses the disk drive and the hard disk drive. When we actually sample a sound in here, so that the Fairlight can deal with it, it divides it into 128 different segments, OK? And if we go on to page D, you can actually see every fourth segment and they're actually stacked behind each other to give you a much more visual representation of the sound. Right, I can go back to page two again and we can load in some more sounds. We can load in uh, the sound here, which is a sort of uh, fuzz guitar sound. This kind of sound, which is quite a famous sound. It's called Orc 2. Okay, you don't actually have to uh, sample a sound to be able to, to create sound on the uh, Fairlight. You can actually generate your own by drawing waveforms, and that's what page six is all about. If we have a look at page six, we can go to the first segment. Remember that we've got 128 of them, and we can draw a very basic waveform like this and then fill that in. Then we can go along to segment 128 and we can draw a much more complex waveform that's going to sound very... it's going to have a lot of high frequency information in it and fill that in. And if we go to page D, you can actually see that there's segment 1, a very boring waveform, and there's segment 128. What I'm going to do now is ask the computer to fill in the gaps and merge from this to this. And we do that on page 6. Uh, sort of interpolation, so that the sound will actually uh, change as it's being played rather than remain static. And uh, here's page D showing it actually happening. Right, there's also another page in the, the Fairlight called Page R, and that's a rhythm sequencer page, and you use that to load in several different sounds and get them to play simultaneously. I, 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 I can't see. Uh, sequencers as we know them today are digital devices. They are 
they, they're capable of storing entire pieces of music, just uh, uh, a, an electronic representation of a score, just as a word processing disk is an is a electronic representation of a document. Uh, what you can do with a word processor with words, you can do in a sequencer, a good sequencer now, uh, with musical uh, entities like notes. The microprocessor has made music controllable for the first time. For the first time, musicians and composers can actually consider music out of real time, the piece of jargon that suggests that it's live. Uh, we've had recording studios and so on for the sort of best part of this century, but it's not been very malleable, not very manipulable. But now music can actually be shifted away from the moment it's created to a point where it can live in computer memory and can be manipulated to one's heart's content before it's broadcast or before it's performed. Sometimes I hear a record and go, that drummer is magnificent. What tremendous feel and power and stuff there, and only to find out two weeks later I've been listening to a machine. But I haven't been listening to a machine. I've been listening to a human mind working through a machine. You know, I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think it makes you any a better carpenter by the fact that you can bash nails in with your fist with no machine. You know, the smart guy uses a hammer. It's less painful. Totally missing the point. Most people think of synthesizers as keyboard instruments. When this advert appeared in 1981, the company concerned was deluged with inquiries from guitarists. Unfortunately, even the mighty Apple computer wouldn't support a guitar neck glued to it. The ad was a spoof to sell software. The guitar synthesizer works like this. The pitch and dynamics of each string are detected by this hexaphonic pickup and then relayed to the floor module where a computer recognizes the pitch and converts it to a binary code. Uh, the, con the synthesizer also recognizes pitch bend and in terms of sounds it's really like any keyboard synthesizer. By using the string select function, you can assign the synthesizer sound to individual strings on the guitar, and this allows you to blend with the regular guitar sound. And by using the hold function on the synthesizer, you can sustain the sound indefinitely. And by presetting different tunings into the memory banks, you can transpose the held chord while playing on top. I think this film's missing the point because because I think there's a there's a, a high concentration here on on the the professional and on the most expensive and the most elaborate and the most advanced equipment available. And the whole point is, is that, is that, uh, th that all of that technology and all of that uh, experimentation and all of that um, extraordinary uh, 
resource is available at a lower level, albeit, to, to anybody in the street. They can go out and buy some synthesizer tomorrow in a small uh, four-track recording studio, and they can make, well, they can actually make a record in their bedroom. Um, that's quite simple. The only difference will be quality and quantity, but that apart, the technology is exactly the same. What cost £20,000 now will cost £1,000 inside a few years, and I think that's going to mean that such power is accessible to all. And I think that's probably the most significant change. After that, we're then going to begin to find out what we can do with the machines. Well, you certainly have to hand it to the Japanese. Anyone who can produce a synthesizer of this quality, at the kind of price it is, has really achieved a breakthrough in synthesizers. It uses a technique known as frequency modulation synthesis, which sounds very complicated, but actually it's quite simple. It just means that you use one sound to control another sound. And uh, the theorists at Yamaha worked out that you can produce effectively any sound using a combination of six source sine waves. And Yamaha give you these, what they call algorithms, which are combinations of those sources, to play with yourself. They also give you some very, very good presets. This timpani sound is um, one of my favorites. And there's very good organ sound. And a good bass sound. But it's not so easy to program yourself. The problem with uh, frequency modulation synthesis is that if you change one element of the sound, everything else changes. So uh, you need a lot of time, a lot of patience. But as a preset instrument, it's quite remarkable. I think we're all, every one of us, are creative creatures. And I feel computer technology will enable us all of us, not just the lucky ones who happen to be in the right place at the right time, but all of us to experience the thrill of being creative. Technological change always brings crises in society. It's not just happening in the music profession, it's happening in other areas. I mean, it's happening in administrative areas where computers and sto uh, storage and retrieval of information are being brought in. Of course, it will create crises, and the job of, uh, as, as my view is that the job of the Musicians' Union is to endeavour to try to anticipate uh, these crises as they come along and to deal with them in the best way that we possibly can. Because the whole point about this sort of technology is that once it's begun from its very, very base root, and that was the point at which, if you like, Bob Moog's uh, voltage-controlled oscillator moved from being that to being a digital device, the minute that happened, everything um, is thrown into a process of change and there's nothing that can be done to, to uh, halt or, or slow down that process. I don't know whether I answered your question actually. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs>